Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about magnetism. Uh, we've been talking about electrostatics, um, and I hopefully you've gone through that whole lecture. You had some success in working out some of the homework problems in it, uh, because um, where we're going with this is into some really interesting forces, and eventually we're going to wind up in special relativity. So we have to make sure that we're building on top of this stuff step by step, because it's going to get a little weird after a while. Uh, but we went through uh, electrostatics and, the, and the, basically the relationship of charged particles in a stationary environment. Um, in order to understand the next step, which is magnetism, we have to kind of remember some of those lessons. We're going to be going forward uh, talking about some uh, the way that the fields operate, but the fields in magnetism are different than they are in elect, uh, electrostatics. So let's just jump in and start describing what we're talking about here. Uh, first off, we're all kind of familiar with this idea of a magnet, and then around it are these uh, electrical, or I'm sorry, these uh, magnetic filings, iron filings that are all dumped around it, and these lines that seem to emanate in every direction, and they form distinct patterns. This is the magnetic field that surrounds it. Um, we've kind of seen this and played with this since grade school, but we're going to actually kind of delve into what that is uh, in this lecture. So the term magnetism comes from the name Magnesia, which is a coastal district of uh, ancient uh, Thessal uh, let's see if I can say this, Thessaly in Greece. Uh, unusual stones were found by the Greeks more than 2,000 years ago. These stones called lodestones had the intriguing property of attracting pieces of iron. They're magnetic, um, and hence Magnesia is the you know, where we get the word magnetism from. Uh, magnets were first fashioned into compasses and used for navigation by the Chinese in the 12th century. There's actually some new ideas that it's possible that uh, some of the Aztec, um, uh, I guess, art makers or, or scientists that would have ex existed in the Aztec Empire might have actually had some idea of a compass uh, some 2,000 years before that, or at least the predecessors to the Aztecs did. Um, anyways, that's somewhat controversial an idea, but 12th century Chinese for sure. So we know about magnetism not just because of the fields, but because of the forces it exerts on things. So the force between any two charged particles depends on the magnitude of the charge of on each of their uh, and their distance of separation, right? So this was Coulomb's law, but Coulomb's law is not the whole story, right? Remember, Coulomb's law was the electrostatic law. Uh, two charged particles in space. Um, they have um, uh, some defined distance between them, and we can measure the force, but what if they're moving? Suddenly things start to get a little murky. Uh, when the charged particles are moving with respect to, to each other, the electrical force between electrically charged particles depends also in a complicated way on their motion, not just their distance, as we would exist, as would happen in gravity, but on their motion also. Um, there's a force due to the motion of the charged particles that we call the magnetic force. Okay, so I have a picture of the comic book character Magneto uh, down here in the lower left hand corner to give you an idea. He's using his magnetic force to wreak havoc on the San Francisco uh, Golden Gate Bridge. So magnetic force uh, between a pair of magnets, uh, the force of attraction or repulsion between a pair of magnets depends on which end of the magnet is held near the other. So uh, this, is behave, this is behavior similar to electrical forces, and the strength of, of the interaction depends on the distance between the two magnets. So this is not that different conceptually, except for the fact that, remember, it says it depends on which end. So here we get this idea of there's an end here, a blue end, and here's a blue end, and here's a red end, and here's a red end. You know, in, in charged particles, there's no red and blue end. In magnets, there is, and we separate these into these things called North Pole and South Pole. So in this set here, the South Pole is red, here's the North Pole, and so on and so forth. You get the idea, North Pole and North Pole facing towards one another. So here we go. We got North Pole facing North Pole, North Pole facing South Pole. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it gives rise to the magnetic force. There are two types of inner... Uh, two types of poles interacting with each other, the North Pole, which is the North Seeking Pole, we should say. We'll, uh, we should keep in mind that we've defined the North Pole as the uh, direction that points towards the North Pole of the Earth in a compass. So it's in fact, as we'll turn out, uh, or as we'll learn, it's actually a South Pole. And then a South Pole, which is the South Seeking Pole, uh, points to the South, um, but it has to have an opposite signs. Why? Because the rule for magnetic forces between 
magnetic poles are that like poles repel and opposite poles attract. So here we see two like poles put next to each other. We put some iron filings in there. Well, look, we can see the iron filings repelling away from each other. But when we put the filings in there between a north pole and a south pole, they're totally attracted to one another. We could see, see the field lines going from one to the other. We could see the attraction here. And this is something called a magnetic dipole, right? In all magnets, we can't have just one pole without the other, right? There's no south only, there's no north only. This is different from electrostatics. It's, you can have positives and you can have negatives. Um, that's what we would call a monopole, by the way. Um, no single pole is known to exist. Theoretically, it could, and some people have speculated that it could exist, uh, but we just haven't found them. In every single case, we find dipoles, two of them, a south pole and a north pole. An example is simple bar magnet poles at the two ends. So here's a north and here's a south, and here you can see the filings around here uh, to show the uh, field lines. And a horseshoe magnet uh, is bent U-shaped poles at the end, so south and the north, and the field lines are attracted, right? The south is attracted to the north, and so there's field lines that are perpendicular here, and they spread out, and they're basically attracted one to another. So magnetic fields, we need to talk about them, right? You can't kind of go through a whole discussion on these things without understanding the field lines. And notice that we actually went through that whole uh, series of slides earlier and we didn't put any equations on there. And the reason why we didn't put any equations on there is because a guy named Faraday, we'll be talking about Faraday here shortly uh, over the next couple of lectures, especially um, he came up with the equations and it requires calculus to be able to solve them. I actually don't think they're really that difficult for um, even an algebra student to kind of look at and understand. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to go ahead and avoid putting any formulas up here. So you should have some ideas uh, about these things qualitatively as opposed to quantitatively. Um, so we're going to start describing magnetic fields as opposed to going through the mathematics. Um, magnetic fields, the region of magnetic influence surrounding the magnetic pole. So here we see a north pole and a south pole. And look, they're attracted. There's a field line that continues straight over here, and one over here. And so we can see that they're all kind of attracted to one another. Uh, the north pole uh, is emanating out in this direction and the south pole is emanating away here. But in every other place, they're attracted to one another. The field lines connect. Uh, the shape reveals, uh, revealed by lines that spread from one pole to the other. By convention, Direction is from the North Pole to the South Pole, right? So we would say that it goes from here to here. So if we were to say, what does the field line look like? What does the vector look like? We would draw an arrow where the bottom of the arrow is here and the point goes towards the south. Um, produced by motions of electric charges in or charge in atoms. Now, I haven't got into the source of magnetism, but this is basically the cause. It's uh, motions of electric charge. Uh, strength is indicated by the closeness of the lines, right? The more field lines that you have together, for example, a lot of field lines right here, but out here they separate out. That means that the field or the force field is really strong right here and not so strong out over here. So lines close together, strong magnetic field lines for the part, weak magnetic field. So it's weak, strong. Um, so what is the source of this, right? We talked about, I kind of brought this up back here, produced by motions of electric charge and atoms. What is the thing that's moving the most in atoms? As we know from us, many, many of our lectures going all back, all the way back to the atomic nature of matter, uh, probably the thing mo moving the most is the electron, right? So produced by, uh, the, we believe that the magnetic field is predominantly produced by two kinds of electron motion. There's the electron spin, uh, and they believe that this is the main contributor to the magnetism. In other words, the electron is, uh, uh, well, let's read through here, actually. A pair of electrons spinning in the same direction creates a stronger magnet. So two, mag you know, two electrons is better than one. And a pair of electrons spinning in opposite direction cancels magnetic field for the, of the other. So we have, so let's look at these rotations, right? We have first off the spin of the electron here. So here we can see this drawn in here, but this electron is spinning around as it, as it goes in its orbital around the nucleus. But this change here, this rotation here is also a form of spin. It's a rotation around, this is the electron revolution. And both of these things, of course, produce magnetic fields. All right, so it's the motion of a charged particle. And it doesn't have to be the electron. It could be the proton, too. It just happens to be that in our universe, 
in the uh, in the uh, in the matter universe, as opposed to the antimatter universe, the electron uh, is doing most of the motion. Okay. All right. So, what brings you know? How does this manifest itself in in objects? Now that I'm looking at the slide and I'm getting in feel for what's going on here. Uh, there's these things called magnetic domains that's, that are set up. So we have objects, there's electrons are spinning around inside of them. But the real question is, is you know, what goes on? Well, these things happen in all objects, right? Everything that has an atom has an electron. Anything that has an electron is going to be rotating around. It's going to be creating a magnetic field. So why isn't everything magnetic? Well, the reason why is we can imagine a, a piece of iron that is not magnetic. And this is pretty common, right? You know, we see our desk, our, our stove tops and our refrigerators are typically unmagnetized iron. Uh, what will happen is, is basically the orientations of all these rotations is random. And so they cancel each other out. So if you have one going this way and another one going this way, another one going this way, another one going, the net, the net, if I was going to add all of those arrows up together and all those magnetic fields together is zero. They cancel each other all out. Okay. But permanent magnets could be made, right? We can create them by uh, placing pieces of iron or similar magnetic materials in a strong magnetic field. So if we put it in a strong magnetic field or even a light magnetic field, what will happen is, is these things will start to orient. So here we see slightly magnetized iron. Uh, stroking material with a magnet to align the domains. What do we mean, what do we mean by domains? We're going to kind of get into the details of these domains here uh, in a minute. Um, but basically the domains are these regions or local parts or the local crystals of iron that are, that are within the bar that are all starting to get the same direction and, uh, in, you know, all in the same direction vector. And so here we see in a strongly magnetized iron, all the arrow vectors are going the same way. So we can even kind of imagine these as individual domains, each one of these arrows. The difference between the permanent magnet and a temporary magnet, well, a permanent magnet here is an alignment of, of domains remains remains once external magnetic field is uh, removed. So you take it away, we take away that magnetic field, and all of a sudden everything goes back to unmagnetized again. It loses its orientation. Temporary magnet, um, or I'm sorry, that's a permanent magnet. So in a permanent magnet, it keeps that orientation even after it's removed. The temporary is the opposite, right? That's where we take the magnet away, and all of a sudden orientations go back to uh, random, and therefore it gets a net neutral or, or zero magnetic field around it. So there's a, obviously there's a connection that exists between electricity and magnetism as well, right? Because we talked about electricity as the flow or the current of charged particles, uh, whether they be a plasma or in a wire. And most of the time we actually deal with magnetic fields around wires because uh, it's much easier to generate uh, or to produce moving electrons than it is to produce plasma, at least in an open environment that we could deal with. So magnetic fields uh, form a pattern of concentric circles around a current carrying wire. So if there's a wire coming through here, uh, you'll actually get a magnetic field that'll wrap itself around in concentric circles. And of course, the further away you get from the uh, wire, the weaker the field. And so if you've got two wires here, um, they're basically moving around. Now notice what happens as it goes into this loop here. Okay, something very interesting starts to set up when we see it go into this loop. So here we see it coming through here, but as it goes through this loop, notice that the, uh, all of the field lines get really close together here in the middle, and they spread out over here. So coils within uh, current carrying wire has an important effect. Okay, so when current reverses direction, the direction of the field lines is also reversed. So if I have the current, in this case, the current is actually going from right to left. Uh, something called the right-hand rule is telling me that. Um, but if I was to reverse the current and go from left to right, the arrows would all reverse and come back the opposite direction. You know, so this would be the tail and this would be the head of the arrow if I was to reverse the current. Okay, we can actually go out and map these things by using, you know, put a wire th through here, run some electric current through here, and then put magnetic compasses. And the compasses will align with the magnetic field. So that's how we can do a lot of these measurements. But this is an important phenomenon. Keep this in mind, that there's a very strong and changing magnetic field as we go around this coil. Okay, so here we can actually see we've 
got a wire carrying current, we put some magnetic filings down, and uh, we could see exactly what's going on in the field. So, uh, you know, the magnetic field intensity, as you would expect, increases as the number of loops increase in a current carrying coil temporary magnet. So here we see a nice circular distribution. Of course, the magnetic field weakens the, with the greater distance. Um, but here we see a, a kind of a half loop coming through. There's a strong concentration of, of magnetic field here, or a strong magnetic field here, and it dissipates out off to the sides as you get away. Now notice that, remember this coil? See how it's strong right here in the middle? When we look at our uh, filings, look at where it's all distributed. Right? Our filings are all right through the middle of this coil. Uh, and then we see um, a zone around it where there's kind of a weak field, but the field is strongest right through the middle. All right, Those loops are really important. We're going to be talking about those loops for about three lectures. So keep in mind how these things work. So coils are important. So what is an electromagnet? So an electromagnet is an iron bar placed in a current carrying coil. So here we see a coil right and there's current in there so this would make this an electromagnet that's running through here that's distributing this magnetic field and moving the iron filings around um, it's the most powerful it employs superconducting coils that illuminate the core um, so you don't need that a core wire going through and there's lots of applications the control charged uh, control charged particle beams and high energy accelerators for example lift automobiles and other iron objects um, it can levitate and propel high-speed trains, all right? It's really kind of limitless. And there's a kind of a neat little video here that I want to show on the subject of electromagnets. So uh, let's watch this really quickly. Okay, so this is a video dealing with neodymium uh, magnets. So he's going to start rotating it. These are all magnets holding that whole thing together. Faster and faster. in slow motion. So what does that video demonstrate? It demonstrates something really important. It's kind of implied in these applications. That you can, with electromagnetics, with magnetic fields especially, you can produce forces much, much, much stronger than we ever saw with gravity, for example. Um, the force that exists between magnets, I could take a magnet and I could put a piece of iron down on the table below and I could lift it up. That fights gravity. Um, it turns out that the uh, force of gravity compared to electromagnetic force is minuscule. Um, it's very, very small. So uh, as we uh, uh, go forward, you'll realize that uh, there's some really interesting things that are best observed uh, using electromagnetic forces, especially um, uh, relativity as we go forward. So anyways, but yeah, you can levitate and propel high-speed trains. That's incredible. You're fighting gravity um, using uh, magnets, using re the repelling ends of magnets, lift automobiles or other iron objects. You get the idea. So a current, uh, I'm sorry, a current co carrying coil of wire is an electromagnet. Uh, so if you have a coil of, wa of wire, it's remember, you, as long as you got moving charge, you're going to have a magnetic field. One uh, comes with the other. They just go hand in hand. Uh, the strength of an electromagnet is increased by increasing the current through the coil. Remember this coil? Right? You want to have a stronger magnet? Right there, right in that center part, you're going to have a very strong magnet. You have a weak magnet outside because the field lines are really close together. So I know I've hit that a couple of times, but it's important to keep that in mind. So by increasing the current through the coil, 
you get more movement, right? More movement means more magnetic field. Increasing the number of turns in the coil, right? So instead of just going once through that coil, what if you were to sit there and roll them one after another? You can get hundreds, thousands, millions of coils. The magnetic field would be incredibly powerful. Uh, industrial magnets gain additional strength by having a piece of iron within the coil, which directs that field. Uh, magnetic domains in the iron core are, are induced into alignment or into alignment, adding to the field. So this would be a typical industrial electromagnet, right? You have copper wire that's coiled around a uh, conductive core. Maybe it's silver, maybe it's iron, maybe it's gold. Who knows? It depends on what it's being used for. So here's some other uh, applications. So uh, electromagnets without iron cores are used for magnetically levitated or maglev transportation. Here are those trains I was talking about. Um, ma uh, levitation is accomplished by magnetic coils that run along a track called a guideway. So here's a guideway right here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, coils in here and basically uh, as the train goes over it, it feels a repelling force that counteracts gravity. And uh, you kind of get the idea. The coils repel large magnets on the train's undercarriage. So there's big trains. Uh, there's big uh, magnets underneath it. Uh, continually alternating uh, electric current fed to the coils continually alternates their magnetic polarity, pulling and pushing the train forward. So this is one of the consequences of AC current. And I didn't really get into it that much. But remember, AC current is the moving back and forth. Of electrons. Remember, if there's a power station that's generating AC current, um, all you're doing is receiving energy, but you yourself are providing the electrons, right? The electrons are just moving back and forth. Well, if you're moving things back and forth, charges back and forth, by definition, as we've talked about, you're creating a magnetic field at the same time. So as long as you're feeding electricity and large amounts of it, to this train system through an AC system, you're gonna be constantly alternating the magnetic polarity. So that's gonna be used in all kinds of really cool ways by the engineers to be able to propel the train, not only to levitate it, but to move it forwards. Uh, electromagnets that utilize superconducting coils produce extremely strong magnetic fields. And they do so very economically because there are no, uh, there are no heat losses, all right? Uh, so here we see something that's levitating uh, above a superconducting coil. Um, really, really cool. It's just kind of floating there. So let's start making some predictions about how these uh, forces are going to manifest themselves, right? We've been talking about how things are, uh, you know, we just say there's a repelling force, there's a attracting force, but things are moving. What does that mean? Well, moving charges in a magnetic field experience a deflecting force. So you might have a magnetic field coming, coming through. So for example, between the north and the south, remember there's gonna be parallel lines. The north is gonna go straight to the south and then out here it's gonna go wrapping up and wrapping up. But right here at the edge is gonna be going straight across. And so the greatest force that occurs, the maximum deflecting force is where a particle movement in direction perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So in other words, here we see the magnetic field lines this electron beam, say an electron comes through, it, it feels this magnetic field, and instead of being deflected as we would expect towards the North Pole or the South Pole, it does something very different. In fact, it's actually deflected straight up. So the beam, and this is what's demonstrated here, we see a magnetic beam here. Remember the magnetic force always goes from North to South, but what direction does the particle go? It goes up. That's pretty interesting, right? It doesn't go towards the North Pole or the South Pole. It goes perpendicular and away. Something called the right-hand rule will help explain this for you, but we're not gonna get into it too much. But just keep this in mind, right? That the, it's moving all perpendicular. The least force occurs when the particle movement other than is something other than perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So imagine if the electron beam was coming from, you know, the South Pole to the North Pole, uh, what would happen? Pretty much nothing. Right, no, no force, the particle movement parallel to the magnetic field lines, which is basically what I just demonstrated, right? So as long as you're coming in perfectly perpendicular, you're gonna get the maximum force. Anything other than that, you're gonna get some uh, number smaller than that. Um, you need a little bit of trigonometry experience to be able to solve those. Um, so is there any magnetic force that occurs on wires? Of course, the answer is obvious, right? If there's gonna be a magnetic field, there's gonna be a magnetic force. 
So a current of charged particles moving through a magnetic field experiences a deflecting force. So if we have a wire, let's imagine we've got a wire that's suspended in the middle of this magnet. Um, we're not actually caring about which way is north and south, but if we put a current through uh, it from left to right, the force is going to be up in this case, right? It doesn't really matter if it's north to south. All we need to know is that it's moving perpendicular. And, the, and of course, if you were to reverse the current, move the current in the opposite direction, it would actually deflect the, um, the uh, thing, uh, the wire down. All right, uh, how do we figure out how much uh, uh, electricity is going through? Well, we could just take advantage of the fact that electricity when flowing, or you know, current when flowing through a wire is gonna induce a magnetic field. We could just measure the strength of the magnetic field to figure out all kinds of cool stuff about what's going on on the wire. Right, so electric meters detect the electric current. There's an example of magnetic compass. This is a magnetic compass over here, a compass of uh, in a coil of wires. So here we see wires coming through, and we could put a compass in here. And the more that the compass moves in trying to basically uh, measure, it's basically a measurement of the strength of that field. Okay, a galvanometer is a, a current carrying a current indicating device named after Luigi Galvani. Uh, it's called an ammeter when calibrated to measure current. So we can use it to figure out current. It actually turns out the magnetic force is related to the current very strongly. Um, and we know through Ohm's law that the current is related to the voltage. So it's called a voltmeter when calibrated to measure electric potential. We can do a lot of cool stuff with the galvanometer. All right. So it's this it's the relationship between the magnetic force and electrostatics that give rise to the electric motor, right? If you have a moving charge, you're going to have a magnetic field. And we know that magnetic fields exert force. So here we have an electric motor, right? Here's a north, here's a south, and there's a rotating loop in it. What's happening in that loop? Well, we've got current, right? And if this current is coming through here, there's going to be a force that's going to move it, in this case, either attracted or, uh, or repelled by north, and or attracted and repelled by south. In this case, it's going to be attracted by south at this point and attracted by north. And what happens is as this thing rotates and it gets into the position at the top, it switches halfway through. And all of a sudden, this loop here becomes repelled to north and attracted to south, and this one here becomes attracted to north and repelled by south. And so every half turn, it switches this relationship, okay? So it's different from a galvanometer in that each time the coil makes a half round or half rotation, the direction of the current changes in cyclic fashion to produce continuous rotation. So this thing is constantly spinning around, right? It gets halfway through its rotation, it all orients itself in a completely different uh, uh, orientation. So all of a sudden it changes its uh, attraction and, and, and repulsive force uh, arrangement and it spins around, okay? So that's basic, that, that's the principle of an electric motor right there. That's how all, basically all electric motors work. They're stationary contacts and around it spin a coil of wire in a magnetic field. That's really all that's happening here. Okay, and um, one of the next lectures, we're going to be talking about the condition where you spin the coil and you actually produce current going the other way. That's how uh, electrical generation occurs, but we'll come to that uh, in future lectures. So Earth's magnetic field, um, we can't get, th get through this whole thing without talking about it. The Earth itself is a huge magnet. Our, most of our understanding of magnetics, uh, especially our early understanding of magnetics, comes from our understanding of the Earth itself. So the magnetic poles of Earth are widely separated from the geographic poles. So they're not exactly oriented straight on, right? The magnetic axis is right here, um, but the rotational axis is uh, somewhere else, right? It's, they're, they're inclined to one another, as we would say. The magnetic field of Earth is not due to a giant magnet in its interior. It's due to electric currents. So this is a, a model of... Some people would say that's the core. I'm looking as I'm looking. Yes, that's the outer core right here. And basically, the outer core is a big uh, um, batch of iron that is molten and it's spinning around. And as it spins around, you basically are producing uh, currents. You're basically producing liquid wires, if you will, uh, liquid uh, uh, currents. And these currents are producing magnetic fields. 
very, very powerful magnetic fields on Earth, uh, surrounding the Earth, actually. Uh, most Earth scientists think that the moving charges looping around within the molten part of the Earth created the, create the magnetic field. And yeah, there's a ton of evidence for that. Uh, Earth's magnetic field reverses direction uh, all the time. So sometimes what we think of as north is south, and what is south is actually north. It goes back and forth. It reverses. In fact, what we think of as being the magnetic north pole has actually been magnetic south pole back and forth 20 times in the last 5 million years alone. Throughout Earth's history, it has done it uh, immeasurably. It has done it so many times that we have no way of being able to know for sure. Okay. So the magnetic field actually has a really cool structure. Um, it basically comes out, it surrounds the Earth, you know, the field lines basically all uh, coalesce near the poles, right, or near the rotational axis, not perfectly straight on. And uh, the consequence is that we get these uh, zones around the Earth that are well protected from radiation. It turns out radiation is deflected by that magnetic force. Really cool stuff, right? Radiation, uh, a lot of it is just charged particles coming from the sun. That's good stuff uh, to, to not be subjected to. It's really dangerous stuff. So uh, the universe is, is a shooting gallery of charged particles called cosmic rays. Cosmic radiation is hazardous to astronauts. It's hazardous to everybody, actually, especially astronauts, because they don't have an atmosphere to protect them. Uh, cosmic rays are deflected away from Earth by Earth's magnetic field, right? The magnetic force is playing in. So if a charged particle comes in towards Earth, it's going to hit uh, the magnetic field surrounding the Earth. It's going to be deflected. Uh, some of them are trapped in the outer reaches of Earth's magnetic field and make up the Van Allen radiation belts. And so this is what this is right here. So the magnetic field is the area that's in the void, right? Because it's deflecting everything. But we do get zones where of intense magnetic uh, strength uh, around the Earth. And between those zones of intense magnetic strength, we actually trap radiation. And so these are called the Van Allen belts. Here's the inner radiation belt. Here's the outer radiation belt. And here we can see it in 3D, right? The, basically, they look like kind of, I don't know, donuts or bagels around the Earth, right? Pretty cool. Uh, storms on the sun hurled ch uh, charged uh, particles out in great fountains. Um, you know, sunspots, for example, are, you know, in the relationship between sunspots and solar flares is, is pretty well worked out at this point, uh, at least conceptually. And um, we get magnetic storms, uh, many of which pass near Earth and are trapped by its magnetic field. We've talked about these just in the previous slide. The trapped particles follow corkscrew paths around the magnetic field lines of Earth and bounce between Earth's magnetic poles high above the atmosphere. So they don't just sit there, they, they move around. Disturbances in Earth's field often allow the ions to dip into the atmosphere, causing it to glow like a fluorescent lamp. Hence, the, uh, the aurora borealis or the aurora australis. Okay, so this is the aurora right here. Really beautiful. We would call it the northern lights, or those that live in the south pole, the southern lights. Um, they're all related to one another. You know, here we see basically the way that these things are fed in towards the North Pole here and the South Pole here. And we can see them. Okay, so we've had a nice little talk about uh, magnetism and the fields uh, that might exist around it. Remember, it's a, it's a dipole, it's got a North Pole and a South Pole. Uh, but it's not all that different, really, other than that, from um, the way that electrical fields work, electrostatics in some respects. The math is a lot harder, which is why we've avoided talking about it, but it's, it's intimately related, right? If you have a, a, you know, an electric force, you have moving electric charges, you're going to have a magnetic force, remember? But the key is that it has to be moving. If you have a static charge, which means an unmoving charge, you're not going to get a magnetic field. It has to be moving. And the manner of its motion, you know, how fast it's going, actually plays a major role and how big of a magnetic field you generate. So anyways, you know, um, it's kind of talked it to death. Um, uh, if you have any questions, as always, send me an email or uh, meet me on the discussion board. So until next time, have a good one.